thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Here you have the title of my talk. I will speak about some um, random point processes, which are discrete, meaning that the point of the process has to be in fixed positions. And um, I will show how this is related to some integrable equations, namely Toda type equations. So this is the plan of the seminar. I will give kind of long introduction to the discrete Bessel kernel and explain how it appears in connection with um, the study of random partitions. And then I will introduce the main object that we want to study, uh, which are multiplicative statistics for the discrete Bessel kernel. And then I will explain, sorry. And then I will explain the main result which basically says that these multiplicative statistics satisfy Toda equations. And if I have time, I will explain how we deduce this result, which is using discrete Riemann Hilbert model. So, this is a joint work that I did with Julia Ruzza in Louvain and Alva. And I will speak about that. And also, I will mention some previous results, which are the continuous analog and are related to KDV equations. That we obtain again with Julia Rutz and Tom Case, always from Luvanana. So, this discrete Bessel kernel, what it is and how it appears. Um, suppose that you take a permutation, a random permutation of the integer from 1 to n, and you denote with L pi n the length of the longest increasing subsequence. So, I put uniform measure on the space of random permutation of size n. And then I ask myself this question, what is on average the length of the longest increasing subsequence? So for instance, here we have this permutation and the length is three, okay? One, four, and six. This is one of the possible choice for the longest increasing subsequence. And um, I'm interested in know, in studying, what is the behavior of this length when Pn is a random permutation and n, the size goes to infinity, okay? And here you have a plot. I will explain what is the result. The spoiler is that this has to do with random matrices, with the tracy widom distribution. How do you connect uh, this problem with random matrices? One possible way is the following. So if you take n fixed, it is well known that the resistance there exists a bijection, which is called this RS correspondence, between permutation and couples of standard Young tableau of the same shape. So Young tableau are Young diagram, like here, which are filled with integers that are increasing on the line and on the rows. Okay. And it's known that there is this correspondence between a permutation and couples of standard Young tableau. Standard because you have this increasing problem. And what is interesting for us in this correspondence is that um, the length of the longest increasing subsequence is equal to the length of the first law of the two Young tableau. Okay, so if you are interested just in studying um, the longest increasing subsequence, you are just interested in the shape of these two Young tableau, so just in the Young diagrams. And under this correspondence, the push forward of the uniform measure on the uh, Young diagrams is the so-called Planchard measure on Young diagrams, which is written in this way. So what I'm saying is that if you put uniform um, distribution on the set of uh, permutation, and then you push forward this measure to the Young diagrams, what you obtain is this measure written in this way. The probability of a given Young diagram that here I called uh, lambda is equal to the dimension squared of lambda, where the dimension is the number of standard Young tableau of shape lambda, divided by the size factorial. Okay. And um, this is very interesting because this gives you a this can you this allows you to transfer the problem to the study of random Young diagrams, and then uh, um, it turns out that if you want to study um, the behavior of L for N going to infinity, it's just convenient to consider a personalized version of this Planchard measure. 
So you put a measure on the set of uh, Young diagram of, of arbitrary size, and um, the, the measure is get deformed in this way. And L, L squared actually, is the um, parameter of uh, the personalization. And you study the behavior when L goes to infinity. And here I put a nice picture that I took from a paper by Borodin Okuk and Feroshansky. And this shows you a typical uh, random Young diagram under this, this measure for L very big. Okay. So this is one of the first interesting thing. And the other interesting thing is the following. So you have this random Young diagram. And instead of studying the Young diagram, you, you can study what sometimes is called the associated Maya diagrams. So the Maya diagrams is a configuration of points on the real line. Actually, these points that are just allowed to go on semi-integers. And how do you construct the correspondence is very easy. So you have your uh, Young diagram, you flip it of 45 degrees, and then you embed it with these two lines. And in these lines, every time that you go down, you put a particle. And if you go up, you don't put any. Okay. So you have this configuration in which, for sure, you will have a biggest, a largest particle. And on the left, you just have a bunch of particles. Okay. And the beautiful result that you have, and which is connected with this picture, is this result that has been discovered by several different person more or less in the same in the same period which is this theorem due to Borodin, Okunkov, Oshansky, Johansson and Okunkov which has which says the following so here I recall you that this uh, Young diagram is random so the configuration of points that you have is random as well and actually um, this is a determinantal point process um, where the correlation is given explicitly in, in this way. So the, 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 the kernel of this determinantal point process is given by a sum for L going um, on semi-integers, positive semi-integers, of J A plus L, J B plus L, 2L. Where what is this, this K? This G, J K is the best function of the first kind which for instance, you can introduce by using this generating function. So here, um, the interesting variable is the order of the Bessel function. So this one. And the parameter of the personalization, L just enter as a, param as, as a parameter in the problem and is the argument of the Bessel function. What does it mean um, that this is a determinantal point process? Well, since the process is discrete, it's very easy to explain what it is. It means that if you ask yourself, what is the probability that in my random configuration there are uh, points exactly in position n1 and k, well, you can compute it as a determinant, a finite size determinant. What are a and b in the context of the Young diagrams? The, the position, and i and j, the, the position of the points semi-integers. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, at a certain point I will do it. Yes. Because when you push out to infinity, it's like studying, uh, uh, it's like studying um, uh, random permutation with n very big. Okay. Uh, but this I will do it afterward. First of all, I will consider L fixed, and then I will push L to infinity. At a certain point, I will send L to infinity, and this will correspond to going to the tracy widom distribution. Indeed. OK. And my point is that one should think about this discrete Bessel kernel as a discrete analog of the celebrated IV kernel, which describes the eigenvalues, well, in a certain regime, the eigenvalues of a Gaussian unit, unitary ensemble. Okay. And so this means that the study of the last particle distribution of the point, point, of the point process associated with the discrete Bessel kernel, when you send L to infinity, leads to this very famous theorem of Beck, Dave, Johansson, which says the following. 
Let Sn be the symmetric group of order n, you will keep it with uniform probability. And then um, you study the probability that L pi n minus the macroscopic um, behavior of the length of the increasing subsequence divided by the standard de deviation, uh, this quantity converges to the Tracy Widom distribution. So you have that this length has the same behavior as typical lows in random matrices. Okay. And, and so you have this continuous and discrete setting. Um, in the continuous setting, you have rescaled eigenvalues of, for instance, GUE. In the discrete setting, you have these particles in the Maya diagram. And um, the randomness in the continuous setting is dictated by the Ivy kernel. In the discrete setting is detected by this discrete Bessel kernel. And then on the left, you have this famous Tracy Widom distribution, which gives you uh, the position of the last particle. And you have an analog um, here, which is QSL, which is the probability um, associated to the last particle in the Maya diagram. And as Alexander was saying, you, when you send L to infinity and you also modify S, one, uh, this QSL converges to the Tracy Widom distribution. And both of them, the Tracy Widom distribution and this object QSL, they are um, freedom determinants. One is a freedom determinant on big L2 space, and the other one is freedom determinant in small L2 space. And uh, what is nice from the point of view of integrability is that both of them can be written in terms of solutions of Panevé 2 equation, continuous and discrete Panevé 2 equation. And here, again, as before, you have the two setting, continuous and discrete, Let's start from the continuous, which is the most famous one. If you take the double log derivative of the log of the Tracy Widom distribution, where this is equal to minus Q square of X, where Q is the so-called Asting McLeod solutions, solution of Panevé 2, which is the only solution with this asymptotic expansion at plus infinity, with asymptotic behavior at plus infinity. What is the analog in the discrete case of um, these equations, well, uh, you have that this sort of discrete uh, log derivative of Q with respect to S is equal to one minus V squared and V satisfy a certain recursion relation, which is eaten here, which is a recursion relation in function of S and L enter just a parameter. And this is the so-called discrete Panevé 2 equation. So you have continuous case, Panevé 2, and then you have a discrete analog. And the, bond the boundary condition that you put uh, on the discrete case are this one. So you have, again, uh, Bessel function. So the, the formulas by themselves, they are not so important in this moment. But the point is that if you know um, these initial values, you can put them here inside, and you can compute. This is a concrete way to compute QSL. So this QSL. Actually, they are topic determinants, so you can compute these topic determinants, but when the size becomes very big, this is not very computational efficient, but you can use this recursion, and this is an effective way to compute this, this QSL. Okay. So this was already known. Uh, what we wanted to study with Julio and with Tom are more general statistics for these point processes, and these are multiplicative statistics. So what we do is that we take, now I will start with the discrete case. Uh, we start with a certain function sigma from the semi-integer z prime to the um, interval zero one. And I have to impose a certain um, decrease condition at minus infinity. So I impose that sigma belongs to small L1 on the negative side. And then what I do is that I take this infinite product of one minus sigma computed on uh, the points of the Maya diagram, okay? So when I do that, this function here, of course, is a random function because the points of the Maya diagrams are random, okay? And then I take the expectation. 
of this quantity. Okay, and I want to study this this thing. I can do it in the discrete setting, and I can do also in um, in the continuous setting, in which now this uh, var sigma here will be a function not on a discrete set of points, but on the whole real line. Okay, so one is exactly. Um, uh, the analog of the other. So here also uh, remark that this Q sigma will depends on um, two quantities. One is L, these parameters of personalization, and the other one is this S, which uh, acts as a translation in my points here. And here I have sort of analog. I already I I also have um, two variables x and t. And here, x and t um, are used to do an affine transformation for the points. So I rescale and I do a translation. Okay? You might wonder why I choose these strange coefficients here. It's just because they are more convenient for afterwards, or what I'm preparing for afterwards. And um, you might ask uh, why I'm interested in these quantities. Well, First of all, because they are nice generalization of this last particle distribution, okay? In the sense that if you take as sigma the characteristic function of the interval minus infinity s, you go back to the previous situation, okay? So these are generalization which are sort of more challenging because now um, this function depends on the position of all the points in the point process that you have, and also uh, the reason why I'm interested is that because uh, there are applications of uh, these quantities. So in the case, uh, actually this is the same case just written in two different ways, but in the case in which sigma is the so-called logistic function or Fermi factor, um, this quantity that I want to study is related in the discrete case uh, to a certain um, uh, random model which is called the cylindrical should process, which has been introduced by Borodin and then studied also by Betea and Boutier. And in the continuous case, if you take again the Fermi factor, this quantity that I'm studying is related to the narrow wedge solution of the kardak parisi zang equation. So these are the reasons. This was the, the beginning of our interest in, this, in these quantities. Okay. And so, and now you might wonder, okay, in the previous case, you had this Panev equation, so what do you have now? So, the first result that we obtained, and this one was um, uh, obtained in collaboration with Tom Case and Julia Ruzza, is that under some mild analytical assumption, this mild analytical assumption are um, necessary in order to have this expectation to be finite. So you have to impose some decreasing condition on sigma. You have that f uh, zeta, so this quantity, this expectation here, multiplies by the exponential of x um, cube divided by 12t is a tau function for kdv, um, which means uh, that u equal to the double log derivative of f plus x <coughs> over 2t solves the kdv equation. And note that here, I just realized listening to the previous seminar, that x divided by the t is itself a solution of KDV. So we are exactly in this, in this setting that was described before. Okay. And um, the solution, as you might guess, are singular when t is equal to zero. And actually, uh, we studied this asymptotic behavior in a joint paper with Tom Craze and Julia Lutz, and then Julian Tom continued this asymptotic studied with Christophe Charlier. And this is also important in applications because this gives you information about um, the left tail of solution of the Kardak Parisi Zang equation. So you have application. So this is the result on KDV. What is the analog? Uh, I mean, in the case of the Ivy kernel, what is the analog result in the case of the discrete setting? You have this theorem that says the following. Suppose that you have that Q sigma LS, so this expectation that I was studying before, is greater than zero. This you have to assume because sigma can be anything. So we don't know if this is greater than, than zero or not. In any case, if this is greater than zero, then you have 
this equation, this equation which mixes derivative with respect to L and shift with respect to S, uh, which is satisfied by uh, Q sigma. Okay, so we have this equation. I will say a little bit more about this equation afterward, but uh, we don't just have the equation, but we also have um, some boundary condition for the solutions. So suppose that you have chosen your sigma in such a way that one minus sigma minus i minus s, you take the product of this stuff, is greater than zero. Then um, you can say that the solution exists on a, at least on a small interval with respect to L, and the log of Q sigma behaves in this way. There is this first part, then there is a first correction in L squared, and then something in L power four, for L going to zero, okay? How do you understand this uh, expansion here? Well, what was interesting before was sending L to infinity, okay? But when you send L to zero, you get something which is very easy because your measure on the Young diagrams becomes just a Dirac measure. So this Dirac measure is concentrated on the empty um, Young diagram. And, and so the ex this expectation becomes this quantity. So this is the starting point. And then this second, uh, second order, we got it studying riemann hilbert problems, studying asymptotics of certain discrete riemann hilbert problems. Um, what is... L infinity, you mentioned something about... L infinity, we, no, we didn't study it using... using. Of course, th this... This would be much more interesting, but this was a sort of warm up. Yeah. For this one. This is easy in the sense that you have the V minus one half is one and the other ones are zero. Okay. Ah, plus infinity. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, but in a way, the back day if you answer on theorem gives you this in a certain scale limit, but this gives you the behavior because it converges to the tracing weight. But, but on the other hand, in the general case in which you have this var sigma, it would be interesting to study S plus infinity and even more interesting because it becomes non trivial would be to study S going to minus infinity because this gives you the, again, the left tail of some interesting distribution. I think I think they are completely open. Yes, I am not aware of any results. Okay. Um, okay. So you have this expansion. You have this equation, which seems kind of strange, but it is not, because actually uh, this is the so-called cylindrical Todd equation, which is a reduction of two-dimensional Todd, in the sense that well, if you do this. Um, um, the substitution you have this, this tau s is a tau function for two dimensional thought. Okay, and this just makes sense. I mean, when we arrived to this, we said, okay, this is as it should be, because when sigma is an indicator function, these quantities q sigma ls, these are minus of infinite topist matrices. Okay, and then this the connection with the two dimensional thought hierarchy is stated in much more generality. And is a result that has been established by Okunkov in 2001. Okay, but remark that when sigma is not an indicator function, this quantity that we have, these are not topist determinants. So that's the reason why you have to go through this discrete Riemann Hilbert problem that I will mention after. And I also should mention that Fredon determinant solution of this cylindrical Todd equation were already studied in 97 and 98 by Widom and Tracy. Um, and so you have, as I said before, you have this um, 
uh, this transition from discrete to continuous, which essentially is this Beck Dave Johansson theorem. And on the from the point of view of integral of equation, you have what it should be. In the sense that you have this discrete equation, you do this with scaling, which is dictated just by the Beck Dave Johansson theorem. And when epsilon, this quantity epsilon goes to zero, you have that this equation here turns out to this equation here in which f sigma is the limit of q sigma when epsilon goes to zero and this equation here implies kdv for this quantity okay so this we have this um this transition from cylindrical toda to kdv and we just checked by hand putting the rescaling but afterward we discovered that in an old paper by Mazuda in 1995 this transition was was already known how much time do I have? Not, not much, I guess. No, um, less than five minutes. Less than five minutes. Okay. I will just say a few words about how um, we obtain this result. So we, we use discrete remanibel problems. So we use the fact that this um, discrete Bessel kernel, you can write in this form. So you can write this as a scalar product of two vectors F transpose G divided by I, I minus B, where F and G are written here. And this is what is called a discrete integrable kernel, which is something that has been introduced by Borodin and Dyfed in 2000, extending to the discrete case, the strategy uh, developed by Alexander Ries, Isagin, Korepin, and Slavnov for continuous kernels. And using this uh, approach, um, what you do is that you connect this um, uh, the study of this freedom determinant to a discrete Riemann-Hilbert problem. So a Riemann-Hilbert problem in which you just have points and jumps, I mean, in which you are looking for a meromorphic function on um, the complex plane with um, some singularities on the uh, semi-integer points in which the behavior of uh, these poles are dictated by your f and g, your function of the discrete vessel. So I will not into the details because I don't have time, but since I'm here, I should mention that this is quite similar to what happens with soliton gases, right? Because you have an infinite number of pores. The difference here is that here, this is not concentrated. This is on the whole uh, real line. So it's kind of diluted situation, okay? The jump of this riemann hilbert problem is kind of complicated because it depends on this Bessel function, so it's not easy to, to deal with that. But uh, there are standard ways to reduce the, um, the problems. And we use dressing. So we use a certain function phi in such a way that this first line is equal to this um, vector f that I was mentioning before. And this function phi satisfies two Lux equation. Well, these are just the usual equation that you have for Bessel uh, functions, discrete and continuous case. And then what you do is that you define a new function psi, which is equal to y, so the solution you're looking for, multiplied by this known function phi. Okay. And when you do that, you arrive to a much easier um riemann hilbert problem in which you still have an infinite number of pores but the jump is very easy i mean jump i'm i'm saying jump because because for analogy with the continuous riemann hilbert problems that these are just singularities on the um on the real line so here is the jump and some something bad happens to um, um to the asymptotic at infinity but you can deal with that so you have this um, this solution psi, and then it's standard. Uh, the jump does not depend on s and l. So you have two Lux equations that are written here, one in which you take derivative respect to l, and another one in which you take discrete derivative respect to s. You combine them, you have a Lux equation, and the Lux equation gives you your third equation. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? Hi, 
Hi, Matthias. Thank you very much for the talk. So I, I would like to ask, can you hear me? So sure. when you do thinning on your determinantal point process, yeah. is it equivalent to do a Darbo transformation on the solution? And if, if this is the case, we'll be introducing, you're introducing point spectrum on the or embedded eigenvalues like he was talking in the previous talk in the solution of KDV. I, uh, okay, but the thinning, so you have the... Also, oh, yeah, or maybe let, let, let me change question. If you do a Darbo transformation, what do you do at the level of the terminal point process? The solution? Well, I mean, uh, I wouldn't be able to, I mean, since we had this talk before, I'm starting to guess that this has some relation this with continuous Darbo transformation, because in a way, uh, what you do, I mean, the way in which we, we wrote it is that this freedom determinant that we have is a ratio of two KDV tau functions. So in a way, it's related to that book. So now, is it related to the physical points in the point process? Probably, but I don't know precisely in which way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but you so did, you wouldn't add soliton. You, you it's more likely that you add these. These, these uh, are not solitons, right? Because yeah, these yeah. are more solutions of. It's more the, the, the stuff yeah. he was talking. Mm, yeah, the, I think so. Alex, Alex, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is how we singular solution at uh, t equal to zero, and then you have this x over two t as. But still, I mean, this freedom determinant, they exist. You can prove that it's convergent, so this stuff exists. But it's true that from a physical point of view, the solution, they don't just there make so are, much sense. There are tons of other uh, the solutions which, which all converge to the same uh, initial uh, data. So mm -hmm. you have to probably in your talk uh, specify uh, which one you pick up mm. uh, 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 somehow. Because of time, maybe we should uh, stop the questions here and I'll hopefully Mattia and all the other speakers will be available for questions informally later. So thank you, Mattia, again. Thank you. And thank you to all the speakers. As you know, we don't, there are no talks this afternoon, so the workshop resumes at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and tonight is a formal dinner. So just I wanted to say that... <laughs>